thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, my name is Nola Wanta and I'm the Senior Director of Business Development and Strategy at the College of Business Administration at Loyola Marymount University. And I'd like to welcome all of you to our webinar series, Impact Insights. Impact Insights started this past summer to discuss how businesses are navigating the changing landscape as a result of the COVID pandemic. As we continue to establish new norms and observe changes in various sectors, we will continue to bring you valuable knowledge and insights and do our part to create a stronger Los Angeles and beyond. This series is aligned with our mission to advance knowledge and develop business leaders with moral courage and creative confidence to be a force for good in the Los Angeles and global community. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly go over some guidelines for today's webinar. Uh, so, as you all can see, there is a, a button uh, down at the down below your screen where you can type in um, your questions in the Q and A window. Uh, these questions will be moderated after the presentation. We will also leave time for an interactive Q and A, so please feel free to use the raise your hand feature, and we will unmute you. Um, I hope there are a number of you who are bold enough to speak today to our speakers, so um, please do raise your hands should you have any questions. And also just as a friendly reminder that this webinar is being recorded and will be available after the presentation. We are so pleased to have our very own LMU MBA alum, Edgar Asensio. Edgar is a commercial and industrial real estate broker. He formulates and analyzes complex financial models for investors who are seeking to accumulate wealth through ownership of real estate assets. He is very passionate about building before tax discounted cash flows, also known as DCF models, and compare them to basic financial feasibility, mo feasibility model analysis. Edgar specializes in investment and asset allocation strategies tailored for investors with various investment risk appetites. Today, he will be talking to us along with his colleagues on the impact of COVID-19 on real estate investments. So without further ado, Edgar Asensio. Let's get started. Hey everybody. I wanna welcome all of you for attending this exciting webinar. I wanna make sure that we're all gonna participate and interact, so let's make it fun. Uh, I graduated from the uh, MBA program in 2012, and ever since then, I have expanded my company uh, I do have uh, over 50 clients, and I own myself uh, a few apartment buildings, including my office uh, space building here in Torres. I specialize in uh, 1031 exchanges uh, for clients over the past 15 years. And although there's uh, some bad times going on as a result of the pandemic, I want to tell you that there's some exciting times happening in the market. I understand that retail and office space, there's a slowdown in the market but commercial industrial buildings like uh, multifamily is on fire. Having said that, I wanna get you going and have you talk to Dale, who is our leader, and I'm just gonna give us a few words of advice and about the program. Take it away, Dale. Hi, can you all hear me? Yep, you're, yeah. you're on, Dale. I, I, I'm just having some camera problems, but I just wanted to thank Edgard and um, his colleague Adam for joining us and wanted to welcome you all here. This has been an incredible seminar series, but some of the industries that have been affected by COVID are um, you know, fairly interesting and unique to the situation. So we have a very active real estate advisory council, a number of courses that if you're interested in commercial real estate and real estate development, real estate law, you'll be able to do here in the CBA. And all of our members of the real estate advisory council um, are always available to help mentor students. So I don't wanna take any more time. I just wanted to share with you that I'm looking forward to this uh, webinar and, and hearing some of the advice and uh, some ideas about the landscape and um, improve my own learning about how the business models are changing. So thanks again, Adam and Edgard for being here and back to you and I'll talk to you soon. 
Thank you, Dale. And I want to tell you that we're so proud of your leadership in that program. So thank you for your nice words. Uh, I'm also part of the uh, Council for Real Estate and uh, one of the co-founders of the Real Estate Alumni Group. And our network has expanded over 200 members. So any of you who wants to become a member, reach out, and I can give you a lot of information about that. Having said that, let's get going, and I want to get you motivated on the video that we have. Take it away, Nola. I hope all of you enjoyed that video. So imagine you have this method that you can defer your taxes in the future and create wealth. Well, that's what's happening right now in the market. It's, 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 an, it's amazing the multifamily business and investment is on fire. Imagine that your equity that you had in your building that you owned 15, 20 years ago, even five years ago, even three years ago, it has appreciated in value. So you have that dormant equity that is just sitting there, sitting there quiet, hibernating. You want to have this equity go to work for you. So you have this method of 1031 exchange that's gonna wake up this equity, wake up this dormant equity and put it to work. So this is what I do on a daily basis with my clients. I've been doing this for over 15 years and just so far, it's been six months, seven months, I have closed 10 deals, 10 different N31 exchanges this year. My clients are purchasing, exchanging properties. It's amazing what's happening right now, you know? And we'll talk about more details, the reason why this is happening. But I wanna share with you a transaction that I just did. So let's take a look at this. Why this? Why do this? You have to wake up that dormant equity and defer those capital gains. Can you imagine that if you sell your property today 
and you don't buy a replacement property, you have to pay at least 35% of capital gains. It's amazing. For $1, you'll be paying 35 cents. It's, it's, it's just too much. So what do you do with that 35 cents? You can defer in the future. How do you want to do that? By doing a 1031 exchange. Also, you can increase your net cash flows. You can replace that property for a bigger building that generates more cash flow. So that's the one of the reasons why you do this. Why me? You're an investor. Maybe you want to have a new property that you want to purchase. So right now you can benefit from those higher values today. Why now? Look at the race today. And we'll talk about the race later on, but what's happening, there's historical lows. Just imagine this. When I purchased my office building here in Torrance, I bought it at a cap rate of less than six, 7%. But the rate that I did on my office building, it was 11 and a quarter. Right now, you can get raised less than 3%. You can go as low as, as low as like two and three quarter. It's amazing what's happening. So let's take a look at this example that I have for you. This is my latest transaction that I did. So this client of mine, I know him for the past like 10 years. He owns this uh, four unit building in uh, Westchester area. It's a nice location, close to LAX, nevertheless, he never wanted to do anything with his property, he never wanted to sell it. He wants to keep it, perhaps, you know, did it to his uh, kids. But he started looking in the news and he was astonished of the property values. So what he decided to do, he called me up. Hey, Edgar asked me, what should I do? And I said, well, let's sell it. Okay, so we got 1.550 or $1.5 million on that property. This is a property that I have evaluated for him about four years ago that was worth less than 800,000. Let me repeat that. Property was worth less than 800,000. This is like a few years ago. What's happening now is that the property values have appreciated exponentially. So that same property, he didn't, hasn't done anything at all with the property as far as he increased the rents maybe three, 4% over the past few years, but you know, that's not the reason why this value is gonna be, it's gonna double. So he decided to call me and tell me, Edgar, let's sell it, let's find something else. So he had on this property here, his loan balance was 240,000. He was paying about 6.5% on that, on that rate, on that mortgage, more commercial loan. And he was getting a cap rate of 4.75. So what he did on the sales proceeds, he went ahead and, sold it for 1.550 and the sales cost, you know, he has spent 124,000. That includes recording fees, escrow fee, title fee, my commission. <laughs> and by the way, all the students that are, are in the webinar, I wanna encourage you to call me up. Let me know if you're interested in the, in the commercial business, commercial real estate business. Uh, it's very lucrative. I can give you some uh, reference and, and some comments about it. But, you know, right now it's a lot of people who want to get into the business and students, you know, this is uh, one way that you can really get some experience, perhaps get internships with a big corporation. By the way, later on, we're going to talk to Adam Freeland. He's from, he's the director of uh, JL Capital Markets. And he's going to talk to you more about that. But let's go back to my example here. So take a look at this. He went ahead and got 1.186, almost $1.2 million cash. Let me repeat that, 1.186 cash that is not subject to capital gains. Why? Because he's using this 1031 exchange method. So imagine that. If he didn't do this, he would have to pay 35% of that cash. It's a lot of money. So imagine this was happening right now in the market. Low rates, there's so much demand in investment real estate, especially multifamily. And you're gonna, that bear that's asleep, that dormant equity, he's gonna go back to work. You're gonna wake up that bear and he's gonna go to work for you. So how is gonna do that? Take a look at what we did on that 1.186 cash. 
this is a fact, by the way. This, this family is so happy, they love me more now. <laughs> he bought two properties. This is the replacement property that he did. He got four units in a nice area in Los Alamitos. So he decided to buy a four unit building in Los Alamitos and a three unit building in San Pedro. Let's talk about that four unit building that he purchased in Los Alamitos. Four units. He got four units, each one a two bedroom apartment. The sales value of that property was 1.2. He used $480,000 from the sales proceeds of the re relinquished property. So he put that 40% down as a cash to the sales as a cash down payment. Then he got a loan for $720,000. His cap rate now is like 5.5%. Imagine that, 5.5%. And just let me tell you that what's happening in the market right now, the cap rates are as low as 4%. And a lot of investors don't care about that. Why is that? Because the borrow money is so cheap right now that they prefer to go buying a multifamily building instead of buying, let's say, a 10-year bond or purchasing a CD. So this is more attractive for them. So what's a value proposition? He's buying a legacy property in a highly desirable area that's generating higher cash flows. So he went ahead and purchased that second property. Take a look at this. Three units on Cabrillo in San Pedro. So he purchased a triplex, the old two bedroom apartments, he bought it for 1.1. His down payment, 706,000, it's about 64%. So he got a loan of 394, 36%. Now his cap rate is like 5.4. So now he acquired a new property, newer building. So it's amazing what's happening in the market, you know? So he bought this property one, four units at 1.2. He bought property two, 1.1. What's the bottom line here? Check this out. My goodness. Just by doing this transaction, take a look at how he, he increased his wealth creation. I mean, this is someone who like two, three years ago, didn't have an extra $750,000 in his balance sheet. Now he does. So his asset value went up $750,000. So he got more units now. So he sold four units to get seven. So now he has better unit mix, newer buildings, and greater cash flows for cheaper debt. So now the debt that he's getting, less than 4%. So he traded off that building that's only generating not that much cash flow. Now he's buying two properties here that are worth like 2.3 million. So he increases the asset value at 750,000. It's amazing what's happening, but it's important that and we'll talk about this later on in the webinar, uh, what you can do, the do's and don'ts, how you can drop and swap, swap and drop properties. And there's some technicalities that we can talk about, but uh, we're gonna talk about more on a macro level, but uh, we'll have a polling at the end of the session as well. So we can all practice and learn. By the way, uh, Adam, I wanna get your comments about your transactions that are happening right now in your market. Let me introduce you to my friend, Adam. He's a uh, director of JL uh, Capital Markets here in El Segundo. Take it away, Adam. Hey, Edgar, thanks so much for the introduction and appreciate your presentation so far. Very, very informative, very helpful. Um, you know, I'm sure there are a lot of people on this Zoom call who may not be familiar with what a cap rate is. Um, and you know, other aspects of a 1031 exchange. So that could be you know, a discussion for another time. So if some of this you can't make heads or tails of, uh, don't be embarrassed, <laughs> especially for a first time um, you know, entry level investors or, or students for that matter who haven't yet really dived into commercial real estate. But um, my name is Adam Friedlander. I'm a director with JLL's Net Lease Property Group. Um, I'm actually based out of Newport Beach, and I got into the commercial real estate industry in 2007. I uh, was with uh, a firm called Marcus and Millichap for nine years and have been at JLL uh, for nearly five years now. Uh, I specialize in single tenant 
net leased real estate investments or what we call triple net investments. Um, so that might be composed of a grocery store like a Vons, a Ralph's. It could be a drug store like CVS or Walgreens, uh, a bank. Uh, it could be a fast food restaurant. I do a lot of fast food restaurants like Wendy's, Jack in the Box, Taco Bell. And our team is national in nature. So on the residential side or multifamily side, like Edgar specializes in, he's probably working uh, his backyard or a specific, you know, uh, geographic uh, area or radius. Um, for me on the net lease side, we're national. So we could be selling property in Florida, Texas, New York, et cetera. Um, regarding the impact of COVID on the net lease space, um, there are certain tenants that have actually benefited from this new environment and other tenants that have really been impacted. Uh, as you could imagine, movie theaters, gyms, casual dining restaurants, uh, malls, uh, certain big box retail tenants, and also department stores have been heavily impacted um, by COVID. Uh, but some of the tenants that have seen uh, an improvement in sales figures um, have been what we would consider essential retailers. That would be drug stores, convenience stores, grocery stores, fast food restaurants, dollar stores, and auto parts stores. So those types of tenants are considered essential retail and have remained open throughout the pandemic. And most of those tenants have been paying their landlords um, you know, throughout this COVID environment. Other retailers haven't been so lucky. Uh, I have a couple clients that own a number of LA fitnesses or 24 hour fitnesses. Um, and they, you know, have been closed and have to work with their lenders uh, and also work with their uh, landlords uh, to offer them some type of relief from what they're going through and, and not being able to drive sales and, and remain open. Um, a little background on specifically what I'm selling, um, typically single tenant net leased investments in nature. And when we refer to a triple net lease, uh, essentially that means that the tenant is responsible for all expenses, real estate taxes, insurance, repairs and maintenance. So similar to Edgard, we're seeing a lot of 1031 exchange uh, capital uh, being drawn into the net lease space where we might have older investors you know, 65, 70 years old and older that are in their retirement uh, phase of their life. And it's more of a wealth preservation versus wealth creation. And they don't want to handle the management and the repairs and maintenance, dealing with, you know, several tenants, changing toilets, painting, etc. And they just want to collect uh, a check every month. And so oftentimes we'll refer to the net lease space as uh, a coupon clipper or a bond wrapped in real estate where you're buying a long-term net leased investment with Walgreens or AutoZone or um, you know Target, Home Depot, and that tenant is taking care of all expenses. So essentially you're just collecting a check uh, every month from that corporate tenant or, or large franchisee. Uh, similar to uh, the multifamily space that Edgar discussed, um, interest rates are at all time lows. Um, I think today the 10 year treasury was trading right around 0.66%. Um, what that means is the cost of capital is very attractive. You can borrow money um, at a very inexpensive interest rate. Uh, today on single tenant net leased investments, we're probably looking at 3.75 to four and a quarter percent interest rates. So when you're utilizing that interest rate and that cheap cost of capital and leveraging that into a, a, a higher cap rate deal, that's where you're going to start to obtain cash flow. Uh, so the net lease space has become very popular to invest in. A lot of 1031 exchange dollars are coming into the space. And um, like I said, certain tenants have been more impacted than others. But overall, 
A couple of deals that we're doing right now, we're selling a couple of Smart and Final supermarkets in Chula Vista and in Palmdale. Uh, we're in escrow to sell a Starbucks in Fullerton, and we'll be bringing out to market a Wendy's in Chino Hills. So all in all, it's been a good year. Um, had plenty of deals fall out and a, and a lot of deals uh, not make because of what's transpired. But, um, you know, we keep chugging along, keeping our head up, and um, we'll get through this. Thank you, Adam, for your intro and your comments. My goodness, you came in <laughs> at the right time, I'm telling you. First of all, we're going to be talking about the 10-year bond yield, and we'll talk about the uh, rate interest rates as well, the correlation, and so far, we're going to dip more into it right now. But before we do that, I see a question that came in, and you're right. Can you elaborate on cap rates? What is that? Let's make it very simple, guys. Net income, so after you pay all your expenses, you have your gross income of the rental property, after you pay everybody, then you have your net income. Just divide that number into the value of the property, the sales value, and that's your cap rate. Simple as that. NOI divided by your value, that gives you the cap rate. Imagine this. Two years ago, cap rates were like five and a half, six percent. Five years ago, it was higher than that. Now cap rates are like four percent. Sometimes like three and a half. So like San Francisco, 3.6, 2.5, 3.7. So a lot of investors don't care about that. You know, they care more about that value and that increased cash flow. So let's Edgar, how, how are you able to find such good cap rates on Los Alamitos and uh, San Pedro? A five and a half cap seems to be uh, a very strong cap rate for the product that your client ended up purchasing. Good. So excellent question. That particular, those two buildings, by the way, uh, one of my friend's colleagues who was selling the property and we put a substantial down payment. So take a look at this. Let's go back here. Most of the times when you wanna buy a multifamily, generally speaking, somebody wants to get in the business, you know, you wanna put at least 20% down to avoid extra insurance on that, on that investment, you know? but. This client of mine, he put over 50%. He went 64%. So you're able to, according to your income in the property, and, and you know, he went ahead and raised the rents. He got a cap rate of 5.4. It's amazing, you know? So he's uh, he, like super happy about that. The other transaction that he did, it was like 5.5. Same situation. During the escrow, we went ahead and increased the rents, and he's getting 5.5 on average, you know, 5.5. But basically right now, the trend is like 4%. So let's take a look at this graph here. So you have the, the bond yield. So as, as you guys know, and if you didn't know, the 10-year bond is correlated to the actual mortgage rates. So as you know, feds are like buying treasure bonds, corporate bonds, and so that's going to trigger to, for the mortgage rates to reduce. So the mortgage rate in the 10 year bond is correlated, you know? So take a look at this. The 10 year bond yield here is like less than 1%. Amazing. Let's take a look at this uh, chart. This is from the uh, Freddie Mac research and the rates, like back in the beginning of the year, you know, you can go to most any institution, any lending institution, you can get a 3.62 rate on an income property. Last month, it has reduced from 3.62 to 2.94. This is on average. So in the cost to obtain this loan, take a look at this, less than 1%. So this is at par. At par means, what that means is that the actual investor doesn't have to pay extra on that rate. So it's very competitive. By the way, do we have Mark online here that he can make comments about uh, the financing structures and the type of uh, products we have? Edgar, I do not see Mark. Okay. 
So basically, uh, yeah, he sent me a text right now real quick. He's having trouble get logging in. But what Mark is uh, telling me that, you know, most of his clients right now are getting like 2.94, less than 3%. So it, it, it's just amazing what's happening in the market right now. Take a look at the spread here. You know, the spread between the cap rates and the 10 year bond yield, look at this, 4.71. It's amazing what's happening. So let's talk about cap rate compression, you know? That same property owner, that same client of mine who decided to sell his 1.5 building, he owned this property for over like 15 years, about. Over the past five, six years, his property value was like low. So because the cap rates are reducing and his income staying the same, his value has gone up. So that's what the uh, method or the concept of cap rate compression, you know? You reduce the cap rate, your value goes up, and the income stays the same. So that's what's happening in the market right now, that as a result of the cap rates getting less and more demand in the market, there's more demand for multifamily apartments. It's more attractive to buy multifamily apartment building. And that's because also, if they want to, if you have a million dollars and you want to go buy a bond, you'll pay like less than 1%, like Adam said, you know? Or if you wanna open a CD, my goodness, CDs are like 0 0.05, 0 0.04, it's, it's, you don't wanna do that. You just wanna come and invest in, the, in commercial multifamily investment. So that's what's happening right now. All these property owners are astonished at the property values. There's so much demand right now, and the multifamily industry is like on fire. And that's as a result of the cap, cap rate compression as well. So you have, let's do a summary here. Lower bond yields, lower mortgage rates equals plus higher property values, increased rental property delinquencies, cap rate compression. So this, uh, I saw an article and also a graph the other day from CoStar that in the next two months is projected to have 15% evictions in the future on apartment, apartment buildings. Of course, that's if they raise the moratorium they have in California, if they do that, you know? So that's, that's going to be, once again, an opportunity for a lot of property owners to come in the market as well. Anyways, so 1031 exchange is a method that you can do to really increase your wealth tremendously. Anybody has a question that you can raise and then we can continue our conversation? Edgar, there's a few other questions on the question and answer um, box. So we have, and, and I'll tie it into what you were just talking about. Um, what is the outlook on the rental market? There, there are laws being considered that is more favorable to tenants where if they are late on their rent, landlords cannot easily enforce collection and evict tenants. So, you know, in terms of the outlook of the rental market, to be more specific, the residential rental market. It's amazing, that's what I was telling you right now. It's, it's uh, as you guys know, they passed this new rule uh, the beginning of the year that you have rent control now in California, as you know, you know? But there's some areas there's like more restrictive, like LA County, LA City, but it's still, if you still own property in the subway area, it's doable, you know? You know, so therefore, this, this is very promising. You know, you can increase the rent three, four, five percent. So you have that, margin, you know, that between three and five percent. So can, you can still do it. You can keep up with inflation. So the answer is the market is good for rental market for income property. Great question. Anybody else? Um, there was another question and, and everyone else to all of the attendees and participants, please feel free to type in your questions in the Q&A and also feel free to raise your hand if you want to engage with um, any of our panelists. Um, but the question is, if you are just a student and, and wanted to get into real estate investing, what recommendations would you make to us? How can we get started as a student in this industry? So perhaps for you and Adam. Uh, I, Macy, I can make a comment to you that one of the biggest obstacles to, to getting the business is to raise capital. How are you gonna do that if you're a student, right? Limit the resources. The answer is family and friends. 
get your friend from your classmate, you know, start saving money, raise that equity, raise that capital. Therefore, you can just buy it and start buying like maybe a house or a duplex in the beginning. But, you know, that's the challenge that most people have. How do you raise that capital? The last one that I recommend for you students, get together with your friend, with someone that you trust, and start saving money, raising capital. Perhaps your mom and dad want to save, give you some money. Your aunt, your grandma. That's how you can raise capital. But, you know, I highly recommend for you to, you know, buy your house, a condo. It can be a townhome. And then you, you can go up and up. I can give you my personal feedback and, and experience, you know. My first property that I purchased was a house. I'm talking about in the way by Ontario area, Fontana area. And it was an investment property. When I sold that property, I think I generated an extra profit of like forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. But then I was able to buy a duplex. So what I recommend is perhaps you can purchase a duplex and have an owner-occupied loan. So you move into the duplex and then you get a better rate because it's not going to be a commercial loan. It's going to be an owner-occupied loan. So you get a rate of 3%. Right now, most people are getting like 2.625, 2.7, less than 3% on those type of loans. So that's one way that you can uh, really invest in, uh, in real estate. Anybody else? Yeah, Edgar, I can, I can add to that. Uh, it's a great question and it's one that we hear often. Um, one of the comments that I got in, early on in my career uh, was to start investing early. Start as soon as you can. Um, of course, when you feel comfortable and of course, when you have the capacity, but the longer you wait, um, the more difficult it will become. The earlier you start, the more dividends it'll pay in the long run. Um, I would absolutely recommend finding a mentor, consulting other professionals that might be in the real estate industry. So that could be a family friend, someone's dad, someone's mom, an aunt, an uncle, a, a grandmother or grandfather, somebody that has had experience owning real estate and may have built up a portfolio. So find a mentor, consult a professional, and begin to do your homework, do your due diligence, right? Just like you were preparing for a school project or a presentation, do as much research as you can on the front end so you can determine a specific geographic area that you want to target, a specific product type that you want to target, um, who you potentially want to invest with. Uh, and then, of course, there are a, a plethora of classes out there, real estate investing classes, that would be beneficial um, for you to take as well. Um, once you do all that, as Edgar said, get together with some friends and family, try and start raising some capital and putting together a business plan um, that you can carry out and execute on. Great comment. Fantastic. Thank you, Adam and Edgar. So I do have, um, Ryan, I do see that your hand is raised. Thanks for, for waiting. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and allow you to talk. So go ahead and unmute yourself and um, ask your question. Here you go, Ryan. Ryan, um, go ahead and unmute yourself and, um, and ask your question. You, you know, I just may add to Edgar and um, I, I just may add to Edgar and um, Adam's comments. You know, I, I think that uh, certainly having mentorship is very valuable. And if, if you're looking at the owner-occupied financing, there are very attractive down payment programs you can do where it's, you know, 5 and 10% on a conventional loan. Um, you know, sometimes that's still a fairly large hurdle. Another thing you can look at if you want to learn is um, look at becoming a limited partner in a, in a larger syndication and uh, follow what these guys do. And that's a, it's a great tool to uh, learn from uh, some more experienced investors. Um, it, how I started with a 5% down on a, an apartment building uh, right after college. I agree with Adam's comment that 
the time is on your side and the earlier you can do it, the better. The, the other thing too, is if you have an appetite for sales, Oh, it's not in my case, but I've seen a lot of my friends who are brokers and then they go into brokerage and then roll their commissions. I think it depends on what works with it. Yeah. By the way, you know, Ryan was, was making comment about uh, your uh, as a brokerage, uh, you can uh, make money as well and save money. So if a student, you know, if you want to become an agent or a broker, you know, this is another way that you can reach capital. You know, you can make that transaction, earn your four, five, six percent of that transaction, and that money, those money, that commission check that you get, save it. You can do like three, four transactions, raise the capital, and then you purchase your first duplex. So that's another way of going about. It. Good point, Ryan. Thanks, Ryan, and um, I've gone ahead and, and muted you. We were kind of losing you there for a bit. Um, Matthew, I'll get to you in just a minute, but I wanna get through some of um, the Q and A's that are here. Um, so from Min Ying, a uh, question for you guys, comparing multifamily units with single family house, um, which one would you recommend? So basically, uh, this is part of the next uh, session that we're gonna have, but uh, let's get into it now. When you do a 1031 exchange, it's only for investment property, not for primary residence. So let's say you own the house, you own a condo, and you live in it as a primary residence, you cannot do a 1031 exchange. It has to be an investment property. And the reason why is because in your taxes, you know, you're gonna report that in your Schedule E. I don't wanna get too advanced on the technicalities right now, but 1031 exchange is uh, specifically for investment. For investment properties, and uh, we'll go through uh, something fun that we'll do. We did uh, on our Q and A session here, but uh, but you can purchase that investment property. You know, you can purchase as a LLC, like uh, Adam said. You know, limited liability corporation. You can set up an entity. You can set up an S corporation, a C corporation. You know, you can set up a trust, and then uh, you can acquire a title of that property under the trust name. You can acquire a title as a you know, in your uh, revocable trust in the uh, LLC. Most investment, uh, most people who set up in uh, LLC, and most investment, they're, they're set up as a uh, LLC. So basically, uh, that's the answer to the question there. You know, you can own the property in an LLC, and then you can do a 1031 exchange, you know, and that replacement property has to also be an investment as well. And we'll get to, into more details about that in the next uh, session, but great question. Um, just really quick, Edgar, I think that kind of follow, what you just answered follows this question. The 1031 exchange is only for investment properties, meaning you can't do it with your primary residence, correct? That is correct, exactly right. So keep this in mind, you know? Remember in the beginning, we talked about dormant equity. It's been asleep, you know, the hibernated, that dormant. So don't run equity is on an investment property, not on your primary residence, you know? So yeah, the 1031 vehicle is only for uh, investment property. Good question. Great. So um, Matthew Soriano, I'm going to go ahead and um, allow you to talk. So go ahead and um, ask your question. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you, Edgar and Adam, for a good presentation so far. It's been very informative. Um, I'm an undergraduate student at LMU and I just had a quick question. I love the idea that you were talking about um, using like an FHA loan uh, or low down, low down payment to buy like your first property. And maybe that first property is like a duplex or a small multi-unit where you can live in one unit and then rent the others. Um, but I've heard like in the LA area and like SoCal in general, it's pretty hard to find a duplex um, or like a triplex to start off that real estate journey, especially if you only have um, low capital to begin with, uh, even though you have your FHA loan. Um, what are your suggestions for that? I know I've heard a suggestion um, to like rent by the room and just buy like a single family home. Um, do you have any thoughts or recommendations? 
I can give you my comments, and I, I know Adam has a lot of comments about that, you know, but I can tell you one thing, you know. Look at the race today. On your occupy, you can get less than 3%. I mean, can you imagine how historical low rates are that? Less than 3% on that mortgage that you're going to be getting. So your buying power has increased, so you can borrow more. So the answer is, yeah, I mean, go ahead and apply it doesn't matter if you put like 3.5% down, 5% down, 10% down, you know, you just want to open the door to get into that investment uh, area, you know. Your comments, uh, Adam? Yeah, my recommendation would be to start small. Uh, don't take too much of a bite from the apple. You make sure that, uh, you know, you're, you're conservative somewhat in your estimates and, um, just start small, right? It, if you're looking at buying a first time home versus a, a, a two unit, a three unit or a fourplex, um, you know, pros and cons to each. Um, with the multifamily space, at least you get a diversified income stream. Um, with a, a single family residence or a condo or a townhome, you've just got one tenant. So if you've got a problematic tenant that's not paying rent on time, or you're having issues uh, collections wise, uh, at least on a multifamily space, you're diversifying your income stream. Um, you'll be able to leverage your capital, your equity that you build up in that multifamily property um, in, in, a, in a strong fashion over time. Uh, what a lot of investors do, um, even, even you know, current students, is they'll start small, they'll start with a, a, a two unit, a three unit, they'll owner, owner occupy one of them, and then they'll live in that for a couple of years and then do a 1031 exchange and then trade up into a six or an eight unit, right? And then once you build up some equity in that six or eight unit property, you can refinance, pull out some equity and go buy you know, a second property or leverage that six or eight unit up into a 10 or a 12 unit. So you start to build off of, that equity over time and by utilizing the attractive interest rates um, out in the marketplace today, you can leverage that, that, that borrowing power and start to cash flow better. But um, you know, with, with, with the multifamily space, you know, typically you're looking at you know, 20, 25% down payment. If you own or occupy, you can get the FHA on a, on a three or four unit. Um, and then on a residential, you know, you're, you're typically, if you're getting an FHA, it's, it's three to 5%, but if it's a traditional, uh, conforming loan, um, then you're looking at 20% down. So it just depends on how much capital you have to work with. Uh, but from a building perspective and improving your equity and trading up into bigger deals, uh, the multifamily space is, is one of the best vehicles to do that. Yeah, excellent comment, Adam. And I want to tell you, there's the other perspective of, uh, there's a few students who have come to me and say, how about if uh, I want to open my business and I really don't want to go lease the space, I want to buy my first office space or perhaps a small office building, you know? Uh, there's what is called honor occupy loan for commercial buildings. And I want to tell you, that's what I did in my office building here in Torrance. That's what I did. So I, I didn't have to put that much money down on an owner occupy. So basically there's a lot of opportunities in the market right now as far as a, a better rates in the commercial space and also multifamily. Many opportunities. Anybody else? Great, so we have just a few more questions. Um, so in a, in a 1031 exchange, how do I avoid capital gains when I have a, a loan plus equity? Do I have to secure another loan to purchase a replacement property or can I just use the equity to purchase a replacement property? Okay, guys, here the secret sauce coming up. <laughs> this question is teed up to the last session, the last portion of our, our webinar uh, tonight. So let's, let's get ready on this one. Okay, so should I go ahead and start launching? Yeah, let's do this one. Huh? Let's have fun, guys. This question was phenomenal. Let's get going. This is uh, uh, the secret sauce coming up. Let's do it. 
Ready? All right, guys. Yes. So everyone, you should be able to see a poll that just popped up. Um, please go ahead and click on it. We're giving you just a few seconds. So um, Edgar and Adam, you should be able to see the results in process. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. Look at that. Okay, it's really close. It's really close there. Okay, Edgar, let me know when you're ready. So Let's I'm gonna go it. ahead and end polling. So thank you for all of you who have voted. Thank you. So there's our results. Let's see? 57% said no. Okay, can I sell under my trust name and buy the replacement under the husband or wife's name? That's my, my that's the first thing that comes to your mind. You cannot do that, right? This is like a trick question, but really you have to know the details. So I'm gonna give you the details now. When you have a trust, that trust is under your name and you're using your social security number or TIN number, you know? Therefore, the replacement property, you can buy it under your wife's name, your husband's name, both of your names, it is okay. And that's because you, you have used the tax ID number or your social security number from the trust into the husband and wife's name. So the answer is yes, you can do that. Awesome. Let's go to the next one. Okay, everyone just launched the poll. So feel free and submit your votes. Can investors go their own separate ways in an exchange when title is in a partnership? I'll see your tenants in common. Okay. Great. Give you guys a few more seconds to vote. So. All right. Fantastic. All right, I'm going to go ahead and implement this. It's almost 50-50, so. Really? Go ahead, I'll share the results. Okay. Look at that. There we go. 48 yes, 52 no. All right. Check this out. Secret sauce coming up. So right now you purchase that property that you're going to relinquish in, let's say, LLC. And then you want to buy a replacement property. Remember what we talked about before in the video that you have to give those sales proceeds into an accommodator? So the accommodator holds the funds for you. So if you touch that money, it's a taxable event. So the accommodator holds those funds. Then the accommodator is going to purchase the replacement property on your behalf. Okay, that's good. So you have your LLC and you can dissolve the LLC while you're in escrow. Nevertheless, you have to wait 24 months. There's a two year period that you can do that. What that means is that you have your LLC, you go into escrow. While you're in escrow, you consult with your CPA, your attorney, he sets up uh, an agreement that in two years, you're gonna go your own way, separate ways. So the answer is, can investors go their own separate ways in an exchange when title is a partnership, LLC, or tenants in common? Yes as long as you wait for two years, 24 months waiting time. So you cannot sell that replacement property right away. You have to wait two years. So that's the concept of swap and drop and drop and swap. Same thing, you can do it prior to the two years. You can dissolve it in, the, in escrow, but you have to make that decision prior, two years prior. So there's a 24 month period that you have to wait. Awesome. Let's go to the next one. All right, everyone, just, I just launched the poll. So feel free to submit your, your answers or your votes. Um, let's take a couple more seconds. All right, when investors sell their relinquished property and buy a replacement property, can they hold back some cash for capital improvement? Can you do that? I'll give you a hint. You have an act, can you have access to that cash or not? That's the hint. All right. 
So just a few more seconds. All right, we're gonna go ahead and end polling. Okay. And that's what people were thinking. Okay. Yes. So on this one, you cannot hold back any cash. No, no, no. <laughs> you cannot do it. If you hold back cash, you have access to the cash. That's a taxable event. It's a boot. You cannot do that. Let's go to the next one. Great. So just give me a moment. Okay. Okay. And we're launching. All right. So the can investors pay off other loans on a personal property that they own? So go ahead and vote. Hint. Similar to the previous answer, remember what we said? Ask, can you have access to that cash? Okay. Can investors pay off other loans on a personal property? So you sell property, you wanna pay off loan in escrow? Can you do that? The answer is? Oh, all right, we're up to 30 seconds. I'm gonna go ahead and end polling. And this is what our audience thought. Woo! 54% no. You got it, guys. I'm excited about that. <laughs> Woo! Awesome. Awesome. So the answer is no. All right. How about this one? Can an investor sell to a related party? I'm selling my investment property, two units, four units, 10 unit building, 20 unit building. I don't want to sell it to my mom, my dad, my brother, my sister. Can I do that? Yep, they're coming in just a few more seconds. Okay. At your vote. All right. Oh, this All is a right. good one. All right. A few okay. more seconds. All right. Be sure to submit your vote, everyone. Okay. All right, I'm going to end polling. All right. Share results. So yeah. people think you can sell. Yeah, excellent, guys. So you can do that, but you have to meet two criteria. Your sibling or the person's your sibling or your mom and dad also have to be in a 1031 exchange and they have to hold on to that property for at least one year. And then they can go their own way. But the answer is that you must. You have to, that sibling has to also be in a 1031 exchange, but you can do that. The answer is yes. Great. How about this one here? So I just launched the poll. Um, please submit your votes. Can the seller of the replacement property carry back a loan for the buyer? So you're selling the property today and then that buyer is telling you, you know, can you give me a loan on that? You know, I only have like 10% down. Can I borrow another 10% from you? Carry back a loan, you know? So that buyer is asking the seller, can I borrow money from you to buy your replace your relinquished property? Can you do that? What's the answer? Yes or no? Great. Okay, guys. All right, I'm going to end polling. Share the results. Okay, so the answer is no. You cannot do that. No. Because you have access to that cash. In other words, you as a seller you're gonna be part of the financing decisions, the term, the installment, the rate. So you have control of that loan, you know? So you have cashes to that loan that you're gonna give. And if you do that, that's a taxable event. So no, you cannot do that. You cannot carry back a loan. Keep that in mind, guys. Okay. All right. Let's go to this, we're almost done. Okay, we're almost done and we're gonna do this as quickly as possible. Um, the, uh, can the seller obtain a line of credit, home equity line of credit? So submit your votes. So let's say today, you know, you went out a month before or today, you're gonna go ask the bank, give me a second trustee on this property I'm gonna sell and do a 1031 exchange in the future. Or let me borrow some extra money from this property. I have a lot of, equity that has been asleep i want to borrow and get an extra another loan can you do that before you do the 1031 exchange the answer is okay here are the results 56 percent answered yes can you 
So when you, if you do that, is the intent, if the intent was to do a 1031 exchange, the answer is no, you cannot do that. Mm -hmm. You cannot do that. Because the intent was to do a 1031 exchange. So this money that you're getting right now is a taxable event again. So you cannot do that. Great. Okay, this so we have one. one more. And thank you all for, for hanging out with us for a little bit longer. Um, but we're almost done. So we have uh, the poll up. So please feel free to submit your vote. Can the seller of the relinquished property move into the replacement property as, pri as a primary residence? This is the question I get like at least twice a week. <laughs> you have a, a investment property and then you want to sell it today and buy another property. Can you move into as a primary resident on that replacement property? Can you do that? Wonderful. There's exception Great. to the rules, but let's see what you guys said. All right, guys, thank you for voting. So let's take a look. So can they? And what you all said is no. 62% of you said no. What's the Fantastic. answer? Fantastic. I'm so happy. Here's the exception to the rule, by the way. If there's an anticipated event that you didn't plan, there was no intent. What that means is that you have your property, your relinquished property, that you're gonna give it to the accommodator that's proceeds, and the cash is gonna go into the replacement property that you're gonna be buying. And so that replacement property is an investment property, right? Like for like, like for like, investment property, investment property, the relinquished property investment, the replacement property is also an investment, but you wanna move into that property. The exception to the rule is that if there's an event like unfortunate death in the family, perhaps a divorce, something you are not anticipated, you know? Therefore, that's the only exception to the rule. But of course, you have to consult your CPA and uh, an attorney on that. But uh, generally speaking, that's, that's the answer. I wanna thank all of you for attending and uh, it was great. Adam, thank you for all your feedback, Nola and uh, Dale, and I'm looking forward to the next web webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. And Adam, thank you for joining us as well. And thank you, Edgar, for the engaging presentation. We really sure. appreciate your insights. Oh, Adam, I'm sorry if you had a few words. Oh, no, I said thank you for having me on. Great to uh, chat about um, 1031 exchanges, the market in general, interest rates. So I'm sure there are a lot of other questions. And if anybody you know, wants to email Edgar, myself, has any additional questions that we haven't answered, we'd be happy to uh, address those and give you some responses uh, at, a, at a later time. And we can, we can always share the slides with you as well anytime. So I see that someone's asking, will yes. you put a copy of the slides? I'd love to do Absolutely. that. Reach out Absolutely. And I will share it with all of the attendees. Again, we're a little bit after the top of the hour, so I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. Again, thank you to Edgar and to Adam for joining us today. And um, we look forward to seeing you all in our next Impact Insights webinar series um, which and in October. So thank you everyone, and we will see you all again very soon. Have a great and wonderful evening.